My biggest preoccupation is that world leaders are going for economic growth at any cost and they, they are leaving behind the health of our population and the health of our planet as a whole. I think that the economy cannot prosper uh, at the expense of the health of our planet. Growth just makes the cake bigger, but uh, it matters more how you distribute the cake. We are moving to a definition of success which involves dignity of human life and not only uh, your purchase power, how much you can consume. Facing less prosperity in our future um, it makes us live uh, our life in, uh, in with a lot of uncertainty. Trade unions in European countries should uh, get weaker and or should uh, also think in a broader sense of uh, uh, cooperation with, with employers to create jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here for this interesting session following on from those um, very stimulating points of view from Pro Professor uh, Jackson. Um, before we start off this particular debate, which I'm sure you will find extremely interesting, I just first of all want to ask you to vote on one particular question, which will help to sort of inform our conversation. At the beginning of this session, I want to ask you to use your uh, My Symposium uh, apps here on your iPhones and other uh, handheld devices to answer this question. What are the main factors that could bring Europe back onto the path of growth? Would it be ECB monetary policy, economic stimulus programs, government reforms, institutional overhaul of the European Union, enhanced innovation and competitiveness, or migration? So could I ask you to quickly vote on these for which one you think is the most important one of those and we'll take it from there. Now, while we're waiting for the answers here to come up on the screen, um, I want to point out that as a business journalist, I've been a business journalist for about 15 years, um, on my daily television show, if I had a penny for each time somebody mentioned the crisis, the last great recession, I'd probably not be a humble business journalist, I'd be a slightly richer person because it comes up every <coughs> single day. And it's often easy to forget that that crisis was eight to ten years ago and since then we haven't had a huge recovery, it's been rather anemic, we've been bumping along on the bottom for many developed economies. And so this is where we want to make the talk about the case for faster growth, but how to achieve it from two very, very different points of view. So I'm joined now by my guests, Luca Vizintini, who, as many of you may well know, he represents about 60 million members within the trade union space. He's the General Secretary of Europe's Trade Union Confederation on my left. And also Marcus J. Bayer, who is the Director General of Business Europe, which is the uh, probably most influential business uh, employers association, representing about 20 million businesses uh, across the European Union and a network that extends to over 70 million members. So, gentlemen, uh, I assume that you both would like to see faster growth, but the case is how to get there, what is the right policy mix for each of your clients with very different points of view. So let me first of all uh, come to you, Marcus Beha. From the private employer's side, growth is obviously necessary, but, and it's very desperate for some companies and some industries these days, but how do we get the policy mix right to actually make sure that the conditions are there for growth? Well, I think you stated right that we talk about a policy mix here. So if you look at the points, of course, I mean, and we talked about it uh, when we were mic'd up, <coughs> of course, I mean, you would choose more. In my case, I would choose, of course, the, uh, the government reforms, because I think uh, there's points we, uh, we, uh, we lack a lot. And then, of course, it's about enhanced innovation and competitiveness. But I would have to go through the list, obviously. I mean, if we talk about uh, government reforms, I mean, we are doing uh, an assessment every year, which is called the uh, Reform Barometer, where we do two things. We benchmark Europe to the world. Uh, this is one thing. And the other thing is we are assessing, together with our members, whether or not the so-called country-specific recommendations. This is what the Commission and the, the Council recommend to the member states they should do in order to prove their competitiveness. I mean, this is labor market reforms, reduce high taxation, and so on. And the, the answers are in so far striking that we ask two questions. One is, uh, is it the right reforms that are proposed? And there, after years in the high 80s, last year we had a response of 90% yes, it's the right reforms. So we know what we would need to do. 
But then we ask the second question, are they implemented in a satisfactory way? Uh, and then the answer after answers in the lower 20s over the last years, last year was 20%. So it's very obvious what we would need to do in if looking at this list, even so it will have to be a mix of all these points, uh, is to finally do the reforms we know that we would need to do them in order to get our economies back on, back on track. Luca Vicentini, when I asked you this question just before we came on stage, what are the major factors that could help us to get back to the path of growth? You said all of them. Well, but what I would, if you don't have the choice of all of no, them? No, I would avoid that. Okay. <laughs> I would avoid that because I, I think f before applying these kind of questions or picking and choosing different factors for growth, we should try to analyze why we don't have growth. Uh, because uh, uh, coming back to the, to the uh, very brilliant introduction of Professor Jackson, uh, uh, if I stick to the needs of the 60 million people I should represent or I try to represent, uh, they are workers, you know. Uh, what I can see and what we can see is that we have a, a very low level of fun, an incredible high level of staff, and uh, no growth at all in Europe. And probably all these solutions that are listed here, that are part of the so-called uh, European economic governance, uh, or the semester process that also Marcus was referring to, et cetera, et cetera, all these elements uh, have been partially, or at some extent, already put in place, but it didn't work. We don't have growth at all. We were discussing yesterday during the, the, the dinner, uh, uh, listening to Prime Minister Xavier Bettel uh, about populism, you know. And uh, uh, we, we, have, we have even delivered some uh, surveys of, among our members, among workers in Europe, and what it comes out is that uh, more or less 30% of our members, they <laughs> vote for populist forces in the elections in every single country in Europe. Why they do that? Because they are all racists? We don't think so. We are trying to talk with these people, with these workers, and what we discover is they are simply angry and afraid about their future because they don't have a job or if they have a job it's a very bad job that doesn't correspond to their skills uh, doesn't provide them with a, a good salary and with good working conditions uh, no uh, good housing no good social protection so this is the situation at the moment in Europe and so to address the problem of growth we should come back to the reality we should stick to the reality. We should try to analyze why the macroeconomic policies that have been put in place by Europe to tackle the crisis, the crisis didn't work at all. And we should maybe think about the, the need of setting up a different, completely different model for growth and development. So what, what I, I'm not convinced it's model? the growth, but probably a different kind of sustainable so, growth so is needed. So what would that different model look like? Because we keep hearing, and Professor Tim Jackson there alluded to that in his graph, do we choose Choose this digital-led path to growth where we innovate because, okay, the, the aggregate amount of growth out there isn't huge, there isn't a lot to go around, so why don't we change our economies, radically realter them, make them more technological, to be clever about how we generate growth. Is that an argument that you have any success with with your members? Or is that what they're you scared know, of? Digitalization is a process and it's a tool, uh, but it's, it's not exactly what we need to address this situation. <clears throat> we should come back to the fundamentals. Uh, for example, what Professor Jackson was saying, uh, uh, it's fundamental to use public investment if we want to generate sustainable growth. We are always speaking about competitiveness in Europe and the lack of competitiveness. Uh, the real thing is that we don't have a lack of competitiveness because we have surplus in our economies but despite of that, we are stuck in a situation of deflation and stagnation. So it's crystal clear that since we have also a very low level of private investment in our economies in all over Europe at the moment, the only way to boost private investment is to come back to the fundamentals. That is, that we have to generate, first of all, public investment, because public investment is the only way we have if we want to boost, for example, sustainable economy. And on the other side, there is another myth, it's really spread around at the moment in Europe, that is the fact that we have to reduce wages and labor costs if we want to be more competitive in comparison to China and other economic systems. But you know, this is simply ridiculous. There is no way to be more competitive uh, as uh, the European economic system basing our competitiveness on uh, labor costs. 
closed. On the contrary, 60-70% of our products remain in Europe and go to European consumers. So what can we do to boost the economy if we don't increase the wages of the people to buy that products and to make sure that our internal and aggregate demand can grow up? So the, these are the elements. This is particularly interesting, Marcus Bayo, because if you take a look at many of the companies out there that are listed, the top-line growth isn't actually growing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of cost-cutting on the margin side, but as Luca Vizentini is pointing out, it, people don't necessarily, in many cases, have the money to actually keep buying more and more and more. Well, I mean, first of all, I would not totally agree that, uh, that the recipes we had did, did not work at all. I think what happened is, and, and I, I, I underlined this in, in, the, in the reform barometer I stressed, is we simply didn't implement it. And, and we currently, and you stressed, uh, and you stressed the digitalization, and, and of course we don't have, uh, we don't have any, any, any other option than, than rapidly digitize our economy. Uh, but it's all about the implementation. And uh, when we were working in the, in the so-called Lisbon process at the beginning of the century, I mean, I think the goals were all right. The only thing is what uh, happened is we didn't do it. For, for many reasons, uh, because sometimes we are pretty weak in execution and we are pretty, pretty weak in implementation. And now we are in a similar situation uh, later in the cycle with higher problems and, and now we urgently need to do these things. I mean, uh, maybe to react to, to what Luca said on investment. I mean, uh, Luca knows we agree that, uh, that we need a certain level of public investment, uh, but of course the main, the main part of investment has to come from the private sector. And on this, and uh, I've just seen the result of your survey, I mean, of course, and the public is very right, I mean, this brings us back to competitiveness and finding innovative solutions. Because uh, Europe, of course, is still an attractive location for investment, but I tend to always look at the figures, and if you look at the flows, not at the stock, but at the flows, you can see that in the year 2000, our share in global foreign direct investment flows was 40%. In year 2013, I think this latest available figures, it was 17. So it went significantly down. Part of it, of course, is the growing of China and India, but part of it is our lack of competitiveness. And part of it is that we will have to get our ship properly back on track. And uh, if I remember correctly from your list, I mean, this is linked to innovation. And this brings me to the graphics of, uh, of the professor. Uh, I would like to be in the, in the, in the upper right quarter of the thing. And I would like to find innovative solutions which allows us to, to grow in the upper right part of the field. Because I think... So lots of stuff and lots of fun. Absolutely. Because, I mean, I think at I the know. end of the day, I think at the end of the day, I mean, our systems is based on this. And, and even, even social partnership. I mean, when, when I sit together with Luca in Brussels, uh, when we discuss this stuff with, with, with the Commission and with the Parliament and so on, I mean, social partnership initially is based... Uh, on working together to making the cake larger and to have something to distribute. Of course, once you have nothing to distribute and once you have to think about, uh, well, I mean, I might need what you have because otherwise I don't have enough, we are getting in much tougher debates. So, so what we need is, I mean, our system is based on growth. And I think, uh, do we need growth is not the right question. The question is rather, what kind of growth do we need? And of course, we need an inclusive growth. Uh, and, and part of what Luca was saying, and of course this growth needs to be, needs to be shared, uh, and of course we need some, a growth which is respecting the environment, but I would underline at the global scale, because Professor has mentioned Paris, very important agreement, and we have very much supported it, but the question is where will it be implemented? So far, we mostly implemented it in Europe. Our share, meanwhile, is less than 9%, and the truth is we will not save the world alone. So, so we will have to make sure that our investment, thanks to certain of our policies, is not going to other places where with the same money we will uh, cause more emissions. Because then we all lose. We lose our jobs and our wealth. And the planet is losing because we are at the end of the day producing more emissions than we produce today. But Marcus Beyer, in, in the making the case for faster growth, but how, which is the topic here that we're going to be discussing, don't you have to choose? Can you have it all? Can you have prioritizing climate change, uh, inclusive growth that is inclusive for everybody? Can you I I incorporate uh, younger people who are facing high levels of youth unemployment into, into the workforce? 
without losing the older workers who haven't yet been reskilled. Can you have it all? I think If not, how would you prioritize those things? Sorry, Nina. Well, this is a good example that we should try to have it all. Because I think, the, uh, I mean, just what you stated, saying, can we have the younger people employed and can we still have the older people employed? I think we cannot, we cannot say we have to choose. Because this is coming from the wrong assumption that we have a given quantity of work which then has to be sliced, and this is not true. I mean, we need, to, we need to make systems better, we need to innovate, we need to be more competitive in order to create more work, and, and we need competitive companies. Uh, and we, we, if you look at the figures, it is in countries uh, where you have a relatively high employment rate of older workers, where you very often have a very low level of uh, youth unemployment. So there's no contradiction. You need to get the systems better, you need to improve, we need to be more competitive. And then we can do it. Well, let me come back first to um, a couple of points that Marcus made. That is implementation and which kind of investment we need. And then we come to this element of insiders and outsiders. That is a really key element also for the trade unions, as you can imagine. We are considered as conservative in this respect, but I will try to explain why this is not true. Uh, but about implementation, I, I don't agree. We, did, we didn't implement our policy. We really implemented that because we had a, a five years, seven years of austerity policies. These austerity policies have been perfectly implemented, but they didn't work. They didn't produce any, any result in terms of inverting, let's say, the current uh, economic cycle. And we even tried to put money in the economy, because we know what the European Central Bank uh, did in this respect. But also in this case, most of this money went to the banks and to the financial institutions, very often to save them from bankrupt, uh, and uh, nothing from this money uh, really went to the, real, uh, to the real economy to generate private or public investment and to try to, uh, to recover the situation. And uh, we even tried the famous uh, so-called Juncker's plan for investment. We even tried uh, to, let's say, boost private investment with a little p piece uh, of public investment as a generator, let's say, but it didn't work. We see that the only money that went to the economy through this investment plan went to small and medium enterprises uh, through the European Investment Bank, but for the general and big projects uh, to boost sustainable development, sustainable economy, uh, climate change, uh, uh, digitalization, all these infrastructures that are fundamental for our economy, nothing happened in this respect. That's why I insist on the fact uh, that we have to completely change our approach. It's absolutely impossible to convince the private investors that, in, by the way, during the crisis increased so much their profits, to take these profits out of their pockets or out of the financial markets and put these profits into the real economy if there is not a good environment for public investment first. I'm quite sure that almost all of you have read a very interesting book of Mariana Mazzucato, an American-Italian economist, that is the entrepreneurial state. She demonstrates in that book that all the digital economy that was born in the US, including Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, etc., etc., all that economy was generated by public investment of the Federal Agency for Innovation in the US. I think this is a very good example to explain why we need a completely <coughs> different approach to macroeconomics. Then, coming back to the point about insiders and outsiders, we are accused as the trade unions to defend the privileged people in the labor market. So the old workers in the factories that have decent wages, let's say, stable employment, uh, uh, very good pension and uh, social protection, etc., etc. Uh, and on the other side, not to defend young people going to the digital economy, to the shared economy, to the intellectual economy uh, that are very flexible, that have very uh, uh, self-employed conditions, let's say, and very, and very interesting uh, perspective perfect is for, for the future. But, it, you know, in, on this, I completely agree with what Marcus was saying. Uh, this is not an alternative. We have to defend both of them, you know. And we have to provide to both of them the right conditions to, uh, let's say, put their skills and competences at disposal of the economy to try <coughs> to boost competitiveness, productivity, but also to have better working conditions and better lives uh, for themselves. And at the moment, the situation that we have is that on the one side for older workers, let's say, 
say the traditional ones, uh, all their protections and all their so-called privileged privileges are under attack because of this situation, and because of the pressure of unemployment that comes from the rest of the labor market. And on the other side, if you look at the people that are young, mainly young people, uh, but not only, but mainly young people, let's say, that are in the new economy, in the so-called new economy, well, these people are the new slaves of the labor market because very few of them have good remuneration, very few of them have any kind of uh, social and pensions protection, very few of them have any kind of right. My wife, for example, is not so, not so young, because I'm not so young, you know. Uh, she's, uh, that, that's she's that's a, very generous of you to put that. <laughs> she's a cinema critic and a journalist. Uh, uh, she's a freelance journalist and cinema critic. So she has a fantastic job, you know, very exciting, uh, she is an intellectual, cultural job, uh, very, very interesting. She, she goes around in uh, festivals, uh, uh, etc. She writes articles and uh, essays and uh, studies and books, etc., etc. But then, when it comes to her remuneration, she's obliged to work 15 hours per day, seven days per week. And when she goes to the festival, uh, to the festivals, she's obliged to but pay on her own to go to the but festivals. Look at this, Antini this is the situation of the freelancers and the is people in the digital economy. So uh, how do we think to tackle this problem okay, so if, we th if we stick to the current situation? Here's, my, here's <laughs> my question. We all know that labour reform as well is key, particularly you, you're talking about a situation like Italy. I have personal experience. I worked in Italy five and a half years as a journalist, by the way, so I do sympathise with your, with your wife. <laughs> um, the... We all know that labour reform is something that companies and international investors time and time again say they want to hear more of in countries, particularly in the periphery of Europe. Isn't the answer to really rejig the labour markets in many of these countries? And yes, that will be painful, but in the long run, it'll attract private investment. Isn't that the answer? Well, I think it certainly is. And there's many points, and, and Luca knows it, we agree. And there's points we don't agree, which is, uh, which is the necessity of reforms, labor market reforms in certain countries. But I think you can see it very clearly. Uh, look at Spain. I mean, uh, courageous labor market reforms have been done. Uh, they are back to a quite significant growth path. I mean, they will grow close to 3% this year, and they create a lot of jobs. Not enough yet, but it's doing significantly better. The same in Ireland. I mean, they are they, they grow at 7%. I mean, they, they have done tough reforms. They're back to growth pass. The same in the Baltic countries. And, and in your home country, Luca, I mean, I think uh, some of the reforms Matteo Renzi was doing are starting to pay off. And we will have to see in France, our biggest problem at the time being, <coughs> um, where I don't think it will be possible without a labor market reform. And, and this is also linked to the youth employment we've been talking about. Too rigid labor markets, too, too high thresholds of entry, minimum wages, all this is hindering employment. But I wanted to, to react to two other things as well. I mean, the austerity debate, I mean, I think we, we, we have this from time to time, but, but the issue is, I think we have to understand the underlying reasons. I mean, the point is, the first reaction of the union uh, when the financial crisis occurred would also have been a larger investment program. But then what turned out is that we were so much under fire for the reason that we did not succeed before to have a strong enough monetary union where you could not break out single parts. And then the policy approach had to change. And this is something which, uh, which is significantly different in the United States. Because they can run a deficit we could not run as a whole for a number of reasons. And then they could, they, they could invest earlier. And, and uh, as you know, this was part of the original plan, but it simply didn't work because then the necessity was there to save a number of countries from really being, uh, being taken out by the financial markets, uh, so to say. So what we need to do, and we need to do it now urgently, is, is to, to, and we tend to forget a little bit at the time being, because of course we have to deal with the refugee crisis, but we really need to fix this monetary union uh, before the next uh, storm occurs. One word on investment. I agree with Luca, we don't have enough public investment in Europe. Still, uh, the most important part is private investment, and in order to do so, what we need to do is, is create a more competitive environment. This is what attracts private investment, but I also agree, there is areas where we need more public investment, but uh, you, need to, you need to see this step by step. There's countries which have a larger, mar larger margin of maneuver, and, and my conviction is they should use it. 
Uh, but there's other countries which have a small margin of maneuver, and there's about the quality of uh, public finance. And this is the work, for instance, the Eurogroup, we will discuss this next week with, with Mr. Dijsselbloem, is doing at the time being. They do a big assessment on the quality of public finance, uh, something of a public uh, input-output analysis, and this is, what, this, is what this, this is the right approach. Because, and then you find out you have countries which, for instance, spend a lot of money on education, get a brilliant result, fine. Then you have countries spend less money, still get a good result. Then you have countries spending an enormous amount of money, get a lousy result. And this is the points you have to address to improve the quality of public investment and also to shift, of course, from consumptive uh, to investive. Well, the success of these kind of policies obviously hinges on the broader economic ecosystem that we have out there. And there are two things that I also want to bring up that will change that ecosystem. On the one hand, we've got the ongoing negotiations surrounding the TTIP free trade agreement between the United States and um, its European partners. And also, we should also talk about the, the monetary policy backdrop here in an environment where we have now negative interest rates. Um, Luca Vicentini, let me ask you to tackle the issue of the TTIP. How do you think that will affect your 60 million members? Oh. I cannot speak about the TTIP and not to react about your question about the labor market reforms. Come on. <laughs> of course, of course. How can you imagine? And, and I don't, I don't may, comment And they that. may well yeah, yeah, sure, have sure. an effect on each other. Okay, I, I will come to the TTIP, uh, but, but very briefly okay. about the labor market reforms. Uh, we are not arguing. We don't need labor <coughs> market reforms. If there is a labor market that doesn't work, that is too rigid, that does, doesn't create good opportunities for people, uh, we have to reform it. But the problem is that what kind of reforms we had and which are the results we had got from this uh, from these uh, labor market reforms. Well, this precariousness, especially in this mo the most competitiveness, se competitive sectors, uh, and especially for young people, this is the result. Uh, the problem is that you cannot have good and efficient labor market reforms uh, in a situation of recession. Because the only thing you are doing is simply to uh, cut the different working, available working hours and the different jobs that exist in the labor market and to distribute the same number of jobs to an, an increased number of people. This is exactly what happened in the countries that also, also Marcus was mentioning, uh, Spain, for example, Ireland, but even Germany. In Germany, uh, 7.5 million new jobs uh, have been created in the last 15 years, but all these jobs are mini jobs. But do you think that any politician would take the risk of enacting labour market reforms when their economy is booming and they're doing well in the polls. Well, come you, on. Have to, you have to take the difficult decisions at a time when needs must, when there is a crisis. Yeah, but the difficult decisions should, should be rational, you know. What's the purpose of simply dividing the existing jobs among a, a, an increased number of people? The point is, what can we do to generate growth and to create new jobs? So what we need is to create new jobs and to make sure that these jobs can provide people with good wages, with good working conditions, and with high levels of productivity. And this cannot be done through labor market reforms alone, you know. We need, first of all, to tackle the problems in the economy. If we don't create jobs, we cannot reform jobs. And what about, the what about changing the skill set to make sure the jobs that are on offer actually meet? It's, uh, it's exactly what I was referring to. We have to come back to the fundamentals of the economy. We have to invest in the economy. And as I said, it's impossible to boost the investment that we need, that is especially in sustainable economy, in skills, for example, in the human factor, in infrastructures, etc., through private investment. Only public investment can generate that. And as Marcus was saying, it's true that in some countries it's impossible to generate public investment simply because they don't have the money. And that's why we need Europe, you know. So, Europe should invest in those countries, in Greece, in Spain, etc., etc. It's an argument but we've, we are heard, not doing we've heard that. We are not doing that. Come on. Now, we, I, I'm very conscious that we're almost out of time. I want to ask you that very briefly and succinctly, if you can, to tell me how you think, that, what your position on the TTIP is, and whether or not it will create growth in this region. Well, uh, we, we, we are not against uh, free trade, first of all, as the trade unions, even it could seem like that. Uh, we are not at all against free trade, but we say free trade should be framed in fair conditions. So what is really worrying for us at the moment in the discussion that is going on about TTIP, but not only TTIP, we have also other negotiations going on, CETA with Canada, for example, and uh, something that is going to start with Mercosur, etc., etc. There are some problems that we see there. The first problem is that this total lack of uh, 
transparency and democratic accountability in the negotiations. There are no, no citizens around Europe that really know what is going on in this negotiation. This is the first problem. The second problem is that there is not, let's say, a balanced approach in the negotiations because the US are strongly defending their economy, but we are not doing the same as the European Union. We should be a little bit more aggressive and on the offensive in this respect. And the third, maybe fourth, the third element that we have to consider is that the, 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 the points linked to sustainable development and climate change are not at all included in uh, these negotiations, as well as uh, the protection of consumers and citizens, their health and their possibilities to have a decent life. And f very final but not least element is that uh, uh, the US didn't ratify the ILO conventions on labor. So we cannot accept to have an agreement where there is a completely unbalanced situation in this respect because the risk is that we will have a backfire in Europe in terms of not respecting these labor conditions. For us, you know, we are trade unionists and we have to defend our people. And for us, these elements are really concrete. It's not an ideological debate going on. Yeah. It's a, concrete prob a matter of concrete problems that should be fixed if we want to have a good agreement for the interest of European people. Debate, dialogue, and also discussion. That's what this, this symposium is all about. Now, speaking of imbalances, I hate to leave things without giving you a chance, Marcus Berrio, to come back on that, but we will be hosting a working session today. You, later you will on. not let me talk about TTIP. I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> we've, apparently, we're out of time, but uh, I would like to encourage everybody to continue these discussions G Give me one sentence line. on TTIP. One sentence one on sentence. TTIP, and then I would like to encourage yeah. everybody to also come to our working yeah. session, which I'll be hosting with Mr. Beho, yeah. where we'll amplify some uh, of these points. Thank you, Nina. Well, I mean, there's so much you could say about TTIP, and there's things I should react to, to, to Luca, but just one thing. The most important thing for me in TTIP is the strategic component. I've just been in, in Tokyo two weeks ago for the P7, uh, they talk about the ratification of the TPP, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership at the time being. And it's very clear. I mean, the Americans managed to have their philosophy in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it's very clear that if we don't manage to, uh, to introduce our philosophy in this transatlantic piece, global trade rules will be done trans-Pacifically. And this is certainly not in the interest of European companies, but it's certainly not in the interest uh, of European workers. And this is why we have to succeed at TTIP, because otherwise uh, the rules will be made elsewhere. So I would even say this is maybe our last chance for Europe to really significantly influence the future of the rules of global trade. And we need to seize it. I Mark. fully agree on that. Mark, <laughs> ah, something that they do agree on. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> great way to, to end things. Thank you very much for that. Thank Marcus Berry there from Business Europe. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nina, Ooh. Ooh, Mr. Vicentini, <laughs> Mr. Fair, for this lively debate and bringing so many salient points to our discussion. Um, before we go on, I actually want to give you some more color on one, another innovation uh, for the program this year, which is the series of videos that you've been watching this morning. So we want to thank the ISC and filmmaker Stefan Chimek for putting together this series of interviews with, with students from our community here in St. Gallen. The students that you see have come uh, from a variety of programs across our community, including the award jury for the Wings of Excellence Award, the Master of International Affairs in, at the University of St. Gallen, and the Masters of Strategy and International Management here at the university, too. Um, it is our hope that their questions and all the issues that they bring up will all also inspire our debate and, and give us some more uh, content to be debating and engaging with during those days. So please join me in a round of applause for their voices being represented here today as well. Okay, as they shovel things on stage. All right, we've reached the end now of the first, first stage. We've, we've been in the courtroom, we've heard both sides. What do you think? Yeah? I have to say two statements for me stood out. One is, can we really have it all? Can we be in the upper you know, right-hand box of having more stuff and more fun? Is there not a trade-off with growth here? I'm not sure this is really realistic. The second comment that stood out, and I'm very interested in the opinion of the leaders of tomorrow in the room, 
are the young the new labour market slaves? That's very interesting, uh, but I do, I do think it points to a key issue here, is that I think growth is experienced very differently, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're a businessman or a journalist, it's very different. If you're growing up in Saudi Arabia, South Sudan or Switzerland, I think that's my takeaway so far. What do you think, Priscilla? So I think that, well, as a woman, for different reasons, I can relate to the having it all debate, and I yeah. tell you, it does not look good. Um, <laughs> I do think it's worthwhile engaging with all of that. And like you, I was really inspired by, by some of these statements. And I think that one other thing that was particularly uh, salient to me was also the notion when Professor Jackson was showing us the graph with all of the, you know, how growth can really impact the quality of life of particular countries. It's also remembering uh, being from Brazil, now living in the US and watching what's happening in the political debates, and later on we're going to talk about the Philippines, the notion that even those societies are not homogeneous. There's a lot of heterogeneity on what's happening for different groups within those societies as well. So even making this moral argument and and bringing to the fore this ethical imperative that we want growth to be responsible, sustainable, equitable, is a hard challenge, right? And I think it highlights some of the complexity of what we're trying to do here today. We have this very big topic that speaks about the fact that when you have sectors and countries and cultures intersecting in a connected world, um, we can't underestimate the complexity of the issue. So we set this big stage, and now the exciting part is that we'll get to delve into all of this nuance and into all of these aspects, right? The political, the economical, the social, uh, in the sessions to come. So please continue to be engaged and, and participate, both here and online.